Hello there. In this example, we are going to look at how the drift speed, drift speed, drift velocity of current changes along the wire. Now, you may have already watched those uh, examples where we deal with ratio and calculating the ratio of the speed. In this one, we're going to level up a bit. We're going to sketch a graph. Okay, but first, let's answer part A. Define the Coulomb. So the Coulomb here is a unit. So we use a we use units to define units. Okay, so let's think of it. Coulomb here is the unit for a charge. So relevant to this question, do you have an equation that involves charge? Well, yes, the equation that we learn here is current is charge per unit time. Correct? So from here, you know, I get Q is equal to IT. So the unit for Q, which is Coulomb, is equal to ampere second. Miss, I can write ampere second. Can you can write the word ampere second? So that's my answer. Ampere second. One mark. But spell it out, okay? Don't write the symbol. Okay, moving on. An electric current is a flow of charged carriers, a flow of marbles, a flow of number of electrons, okay? In the following list, underline the possible changes for a charge possible charges <laughs> possible charges for a charge carrier so let's think a bit our charge carriers the the tiniest one of is our little baby electrons right so our charge carriers are not marbles huh? are e electrons okay in your circuit all right so if they are electrons then um Let's think about what is one electronic charge, or rather, what is the charge of one electron? Charge of one electron is 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19 Coulomb. And you might be asking, wondering, Miss, Miss, ah, Miss, this number, they give, ah, ah, they give you in the exam. Don't worry, if you don't remember this, uh, what I like to call the elementary charge, it will be given to you in your table of constant. But it's always useful to know these numbers, okay? And if you think about this, charge carriers must have, maybe, maybe for example, you have two valence electrons or you have three valence electrons. So whatever my charge carrier is, it has to be multiples of E. Integer multiples. So the charges of the charge carrier must be integer multiples of E. Teacher, what does that mean? Ah? Integer multiple means 1e or 2e or 3e or 4e or dot 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 dot. So then I look at this. Okay, let's pull up my calculator first. So what I'm going to do now is to, to try to figure out which one are integer multiples. Okay, there are a few low-hanging fruits that I can choose or throw away. For example, I will definitely underline 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19. This is 1e. Okay. I will definitely not underline 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 20. Are you saying that this is one tenth of an electron? You have a tiny, tiny electron and then you split it into 10 pieces. Your bro, we don't share like that. Okay. So no. Too small. Nani. So they are not, this 1 over 10 is not an integer multiple. Right now we have left with 2. Let's bring out our good friend, Casey or the calculator. So what I'll do now is I'll take 4 times 10 to the power of negative 19, if you must, divided by 1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19. So if I get an integer number, then this is a possibility. But let's see. I uh, 2.5, there's no integer, correct lah. So this one is out because this is 2.5e. Again, you cannot have half an electron. Electron is a whole thing. You either get one or you get none. Or you get two or you get three. All right, last bet, eight. I think eight can. So if I replace this by eight, I will get five. Ah, we got five valence electron, 5e. So this one is okay to go. We can underline this. All right. So important thing to remember is that the charge of every electron, especially if you don't do chemistry, okay, charge of every electron is the same. 
1.6 times 10 to the power of negative 19 coulomb. You forget this number, you can find from the data booklet, or not data booklet, like table of constants in the front of your question paper. All your charge carrier must be integer multiples, 1e, 2e, 3e, 4e, whatever. Lah, okay? Fraction cannot. All right. So now we're going to this uh, beautiful looking wire. Oh boy. Okay. This cone looking shape, okay, says that the diameter of a wire ST varies linearly. Hmm, interesting. This, this sentence. I want to highlight it. With distance along the wire as shown in figure 6.1. Okay, pretty obvious. You can see this part here is, is a straight line, right? So the diameter actually changes in a linear fashion. Or in other words, if let's say I measure here as x, then if I plot a graph of d against x, I'm going to get a line like this. Okay, so here is s and here is t. All right, okay, so anyway... Um, it says here that there is a current I in the wire, and at NS, the diameter is D. At T, the diameter becomes 2D. Interesting. So this means the diameter here is D, and the diameter here dot, 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 is 2D. And this point here is S, this point here is T. I think you get the idea already. Okay? So... Uh, on figure 6.2, which is a graph grid below, sketch a graph to show the variation of average drift speed with position along the wire between S and T. Okay, so drift speed, right? Our equation for drift speed, I is equal to NAVE, NAVE, is a value for average. Okay, so you don't have to like get too uh, worried about the term average. Just understand that our drift speed here is this V. And it's always average one. Because we can't expect all the electrons to move at the same speed. Identical. Uh, it's not possible. Okay. So whatever we find is estimate. It's an average. Okay. So right now, we're going to try to represent this here. Um, it says here that at the NS... The, the diameter is D, and the average drift speed of the free electron is Bs. So normally when they draw a graph, whenever you see like a, a beautiful empty space like that, read the question carefully. Number one, try to see if the question offers you any coordinates or values. So are there any values or plot point given in question? Sometime they will give. Okay, like this one. They give it to you. They say it says here at the point S, the drift velocity is Vs. So point S is here. So I already have one point just here. I'm going to plot this. Okay, so read the question. Sometimes the question will even give you two coordinates, but not in this case. Lah. All right, so examine the question carefully. See if there's any missed out uh, values given in the, in the question that you can plot on your graph. The second one is... Normally, one point is not enough to plot anything, like, okay? So, so what are you going to do? You now have to use the uh, drift speed equation. I is equal to NAVE. Okay, so when we use this I equal to NAVE, well, you know the drill. Determine the constant to try to see how V, the drift speed V, changes with position. So you chill first. Huh? Who is constant? Let's list them down. Constant here is I, same metal, and electronic charge is that 1.6 times 10 to the power negative 19, so it's always the same thing. So, hey, hey, familiar friend. A multiplied by V is equal to a constant, meaning to say the drift speed is inversely proportional to area square, which is also inversely proportional to diameter square. Chef case. Okay, okay. Teacher, very nice. But this one not diameter. <laughs> How? Okay. So right now, in the best case scenario, you will have V and D. Ah, then you can drop. But right now, you got V, but you ain't got no diameter in the graph. But do you forget? In this part here, it says that the diameter varies linearly with the distance 
along the distance of the wire as shown in figure 6.1. So diameter is actually linear to x, not really proportional, but linear. So I'm going to bring that in as fact number 3. D varies linearly with x. Okay, so having listed down all the important information, I have to decide now, can I find a few more coordinates to help me along the way? The answer is yes. Okay, so for example, I know that at T, you know, this diameter here was D, but then the wire get thicker and thicker. So the diameter here is 2D, D and 2D. So maybe I can find Vs, right? The drift speed at 2D. So it's either you remember the previous example and you know it's 1 over 4, or let's say you don't know. So we're going to start using the ratio, okay? Move this down, give me more space, and then I will use the ratio. So the ratio that I will write here is uh, V at point S over V at point T is equal to diameter at point T over diameter at point S, whole thing square. What's the diameter at point T? Ah, point T. T is the thick part, right? So this is 2D over D squared. So what I have is Vs over Vt is 4, right? So finally, I will get Vt is equal to 1 over 4 Vs or 0 0.25 Vs. Hmm. Congratulations, you have the second coordinate, 0 0.25. Okay. So if let's say <coughs> there are two ways to go about it. Let's say, for example, if you have a good sense of the graph, right? You really know that there's a coordinate here, there's a coordinate here. And now you have to join these two points. If your immediate thinking is missed, I know, I know. I'm going to draw a straight line like that. Ayo, straight line, ah. Uh, you must be able to justify a linear relationship between V and X. There is no linear relationship between V and X, right? The only linear relationship that you have with X is the diameter, okay? So if D varies linearly with X, but uh, drift speed varies... Uh, you know, drift speed is proportional to 1 over d square. So loosely speaking, it is proportional to x square. 1 over x square. Okay? So we can be yes. So you kind of like make sure this one means that there is a curve. But of course, this will cause people a bit of um, anxiety because you may be thinking like, teacher, uh -huh. so I know it's a curve, but you know, is this because it's positive x squared? So I should draw a curve like this. Like a curve, like a decreasing gradient curve. Yes, this is the answer. But if your brain don't allow you to do this, don't worry. I got you. We find the midpoint. Okay. So what do we know here? We know that this changes uh, linearly. Meaning to say, uh, whatever change that happens from here to here, which is plus d, here to here, you add D, right? D plus D is 2D. Meaning here to here, you will add half D. 0 0.5D. So this thing is actually 1.5D. Why did I do this again? Because a third point will help us determine the curvature. Especially if you, <laughs> you, you, you just don't, know, don't like to look at X squared. So this is an alternative for you. Okay, so I'm going to put 1.5d into the equation. Let's just squish this a bit to the side. I'm going to continue here, okay? Because remember, we had this already. To use this again, it's pretty fast, right? So now Vs over, uh, yeah, what point you want to call this? Let's say point K, lah, because we are okay. In the pandemic, online learning, learn on your own. Look at you, go. You are okay. So I'll call, call it point K. All right, so this one will be the diameter at K over the diameter at S square. What's the diameter at K again? 1.5D. What's the diameter at S again? And the starting point, D square. 
So what we're looking at is actually 1.5 square Vs over Vk. So in this case, our Vk is actually, um, I mean, I don't know what 1.5 square is, but Vs over 1.5 square. Okay, let me ask my calculator. Boop. Okay, 1 divided by 1.5 square. So I got something like 0. Point, oh, Chinese don't like number. <laughs> 0. 0.44. Okay. 0. 0.44 Vs. Let's plot this point. Where is 0. 0.44? So if you look at this graph, um, the scale is a bit off, but it's okay, right? Here we have 10 boxes is 0. 0.25. So one box here is 0. 0.025. I just need to know how many boxes, okay? So what I'll do is I will take 0. 0.44 divided by 0. 0.025 to see how many small boxes should I plot. In this case, it's 17.6 or around 17 and a half boxes. I, I'm going to let the calculator work for me, but this is, this is 10. So why you have a calculator? This is 10, 17 and a half. So this is 17. 17 and a half is somewhere here. Okay, so I'm counting boxes. Now you look at the trend. The drop from here to here is from 1 to 0 0.44. And the drop from here to here is 0 0.44 to 0 0.25. So the initial drop is small. And then for the second same amount of length, which is 0 0.5D, you drop less. So if you just join these three dots together, it should be pretty obvious that you are drawing a decreasing gradient curve. Okay. So whenever you have equation, right, look, you can do it the quick way by seeing that this is x square and draw an x square curve. Okay. But if your brain cannot justify because of domain and range and you're the overthinking type, very quickly understand that because it varies linearly, so when the length increases by half D, I repeat the same ratio process here, this purple color part, and found 0 0.44. Okay, then I plot this 0 0.44. And then with a smooth and steady hand, I will draw in these points. Try my best, huh? With decreasing gradient. So something like this. But this gradient is not zero. Huh? All right. So this graph is worth three marks. Don't be afraid if they reverse the graph. Maybe, maybe I'll start with the thick side. You know, I, I flip the thick side I put here, the thin side I put here. Or even funnier, I do the wire where big, small, big. Ah, don't be scared. You can do this one because ratio is your best friend. This ratio, okay? Then you can get this curve. All right. So where are the marks? Okay. So one mark if, or rather, let me show you the mark scheme. Okay. So one mark if you take a line and draw between 1 to 0 0.25. So they don't care, la. you draw a straight line, you draw a squiggly line. <laughs> as long as the direct connection between 1 to 0 0.25 at the end, you're okay, you get one mark. The other mark is for the curvature. Do you really need to work this hard for the curvature? Um, it's to hone your instinct. So they expect you to actually just look at this and know that because it varies linearly, it drops. But I understand that somehow if your brain has that kink, here's a suggested step that you can do. Please understand that every paper, there will be certain marks that are very hard to earn because we need to figure out who is the top in the world. Okay, just for price giving. Doesn't determine your value as a student, just for price giving. But don't give up. Maybe you can get that last mark, bonus mark. All right, if not, plot the point, use your best guess. But so here are two different methods that you can try out. Go sketch more graphs. There are more in your past year question. I'll see you in the next example. Bye.